Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Great. So welcome to my talk. Let me check. It works. OK. So um, hello. My talk will be how hard is this the dry GPU driver. Um, first, let me thank you for your game, because like people, interest, uh, people who are interested in CI, there is not so many of people. And I think it's really important part of our lives to ship some high quality products. So thank you for coming. And let's start it. So a um, little bit about me. I generally work on mostly open source products. I recently worked on GPU drivers, previously also on GPU drivers. Um, I find a lot of pleasure in mainlining Linux phones and other devices. And uh, I see a lot of potential in Linux devices as a phones and tablets. So that's my favorite thing to do. And let's go to our talk. So content is easy. Why? Uh, what we use as a stack, which test we use, how do we apply these tests, and you know what you need if you want to build your farm. And it's the best results, how to get them. So why? Uh, probably I ask you this way. Uh, anyone here who never interacted with CI? Anyone who didn't brought some own CI? Or every one of you ever built some CI, right? Really? OK, good, good. So I will skip this part, and let's go to building blocks. So for you to understand, we generally have the game you want to play, the game interact with our library, Mesa, Mesa 3D. And uh, our library, Mesa 3D, interact with DRM. And DRM stack in the Linux kernel will interact with GPU. So our testing, um, if I had laser, I would show you. But let me show my hand. It's like between Mesa and GPU, usually. That, that's the part we're testing. Uh, I will explain why we're testing also GPU, even if we want to test our Mesa. And Second diagram shows uh, the internal uh, function of Mesa. So we have the, the drivers itself has the core. Then there is Gallium framework, which takes care about OpenGL, OpenCL directory, for example, and Teflon for TensorFlow, and also maybe some other stuff. And uh, also Vulkan part, but that's not the Gallium part. Gallium part takes about these standards only. But Mesa as a whole takes care about Vulkan and everything of this. So for a start, we're working with GitLab. Uh, there is a nice GitLab stand here on the event. And this is how can our pipeline look like. Uh, it's not everything, as you can see, like there is, if you click on some, you see much more runners, much more jobs. So this is one part. And that's not all. This is second half of the screen of our pipeline. So as you can see, we have nice coverage. We test a lot of things. Um, so let me describe. We do basic sanity check that like the code looks good enough to start testing something to not waste resources. Uh, we built a Mesa for multiple architectures. That's the basic stuff. So we build it for ARM64, we build it for ARM 30-bit, we build it for uh, IMD64, and we also build some obscure architectures and stuff, which we don't test later, we just do build tests. That's the easy part. We do some code, code validation and some linting, and then we run for each manufacturer, each stage, we run another set of tests. We're covering Intel, IMD, ARM, um, Adreno from Qualcomm. We, we cover a lot of stuff. We also cover virtualization. So we have Venus and Virgil. So um, when I started working on this in 2022, back then, and I joined the team, um, the Firefox was able with this pipeline crash. Just, you know, you, sometimes you open pipeline and Firefox crashed. And also uh, CLI tools was not um, 
well adjusted to this size of pipeline, so it's also sometimes crashed. And so it's pretty huge. And how, how do we run? We have GitLab CI, which connects to GitLab runners. And we use currently like mostly two solutions. One is Lava and one is Tron CI. Uh, I think uh, we have some talks about Lava on this conference. It's an uh, environment originally developed by Linaro, uh, which is meant for testing um, devices uh, and mostly ARM64 stuff. And Tron CI, which currently is mostly used for IMD64 stuff, for uh, IMD machines at Valve. And then you have DUT, which is device under the test, which is the final device. Because most of the, our tests are not these which you can run on GitLab servers, but they are on the devices. So what do we run on the devices? So we, we're testing GPU drivers. So first thing to run is Kronos VKGL CTS. It's a test suite which, complement, which con contains uh, like 1 to 0.8 million tests approximately. And it, it tries to test every each aspect of some function of GPU. So it tries to give a coverage of the small things. And uh, generally it's like one of most efficient things we use. Then we have Piglet, which is small, something like a little bit higher level than VKGL CTS because it usually tests some scenarios the developers previously found. So if you have some failure uh, in the driver, which can be reproduced, for example, by uh, some sequence of commands, there will be probably some Piglet test for it. So if you need test uh, GPU, you use Piglet. Uh, we have also SQ SQQP, which is uh, quality testing for SCIA library, which is used, for example, by Android or a library office. And we have traces. Traces are amazing thing, how to save time and not have to play games on your CI. So for the, for the testing, you sometimes want to test some games if they're running properly, but no one has time to do that, right? So, and in the CI, you don't, you don't also want to pull all the games and the image would be enormous. So what we do is we run the game locally. We just start recording we record these uh, commands which go to GPU and we just replay them without the game. It's sometimes a little bit imprecise, sometimes it has quirky scenarios, but in general we are able to reproduce the rendering which game do and we can compare against the image which then translates to some checksum which we save and we know every time the checksum will change. Uh, for this, we have IPTrace, uh, which runs OpenGL and Direct3D uh, traces, and GFX Reconstruct for Vulkan. So this is our, mainly our test. So now the testing part itself. So uh, first thing, we use MargeBot. It's a very useful tool for one thing. If you have, if you have two changes which uh, conflict at code level, it's easy, you, uh, you want to merge one thing, it gets merged, second thing will refuse to merge, that's easy. But in case you have um, two changes which both pass from the code, code point of view, but don't pass at CI level, because you may enable in one change one feature, and in second change you will change something somewhere else, which also is affected by first feature, then like at the moment where pipeline passes, you want to have all changes which was done before to merge the stuff. So MargeBot ensures like each merge request gets one by one merged and checked just before the merging. So uh, we use pre-merge. Important thing about pre-merge is uh, you want to do it everywhere because developers are lazy and they never want to fix their code after it gets merged. And it happened to us sometimes because we have multiple farms. And sometimes due to difficulties like outages of internet, energy, or you know some weird issues, we have to shut them down. And at the point when you shut down one farm which does something important, 
one day passes and some code gets merged, it's really hard to convince the developers to fix their code re retroactively. So I think pre-merge is very good investment, but uh, it has some issues or challenges, I would say. First is stability. Uh, if you want to test every merge request in real, in real time, you have to, have, have to be quick. So you need like something like be done in 20 minutes, optimally. And for this, if you're testing GPU hardware, there is multiple level of flakiness. First, uh, sometimes the GPU itself behaves a bit flaky in some situation. Second, the tests sometimes are not perfect and there is a lot of them, so they can be also flaky. Then you have neat work and you have the device like the silicon itself, which sometimes behaves weirdly because you know you test 24 seven on it. And of course there is also net neat work, there is also GitLab. So you have a lot of points of failure in there and you want to be sure it will pass in 20 minutes, at least maybe 30 if you're unlucky. So the tri trick is you need to at least implement some retry at multiple levels and you need to keep uh, this in check. So you don't retry too much because of there is something broken and you have no idea what is it, but you just blindly retry. You don't want to do that either because you will stall the system. So that's one thing. Second thing is quality. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, VK uh, CTS has something like 2.8 million tests. And if you have low power embedded devices, you cannot run all the tests in 15 minutes. Even what we do is uh, parallel runs. So we split each part of the test on one device and we use, for example, at the same moment, like 10 devices for same test, but it's still not enough. So what you want to do uh, is reduce the number of tests. So use, for example, some fraction. And when you use the fraction, you're still keeping something un uncovered. So there we getting to nightly testing because we cannot test everything on every hardware. What we're trying to compensate there is like testing everything because it's not that pleasant to report the failure retro retroactively, but it's still better than nothing. So for nightly testing, we do that. We just reserve like one to three runners per device, depending how many of these devices we have available. And we do the testing overnight. So uh, I have the question which is outlined here. Uh, Anyone see a problem with testing overnight? Yes? Good, good, good. Exactly, where is the night, right? So uh, since like Mesa, uh, we have contributors from Asia, from Europe, from US, um, it's like uh, there is never night. But so far, we decided to do something like we just tipped the time when like minimum people uh, contribute at the time and we just decided that to be night. But uh, good catch, yeah. <laughs> so um, so we, we reserve just few runners, but we let like run them like for three, four hours in uh, without stopping. And if someone wants to merge something, he still will have some runners available. Huh. Um, what is also a good one is some farms have devices which are not that stable. And I mean by nature. So they have some other problems than GPU drivers or the GPU drivers are not that advanced enough so they can produce a consistent result. So that's another thing where we can use nightly testing because if it fails, it not blocks anyone. So uh, what, what, what do you want to do if you want to like Let's say you, you developing GPU. Uh, is, is there anyone who like considering using uh, and connecting to Mesa, Mesa CI? Uh, is, is there anyone who's looking for get some device tested within our system? And anyone planning to do some deployment for their own company or something like that recently? Like in recent future? Nope, okay. Okay, so uh, I, will, I will go faster through this phase. So in general, if you want to like uh, connect some device you want to test, uh, you want to use one of the solution. One is Tron CI. It's Docker based. You just deploy some images. It will download from the internet the configuration where you set up 
it will be. It's completely configurationless on the machine. And you will upload images to the each device, which get automatically tested and connected to your uh, Tron CI uh, coordinator. And uh, that's the simpler solution. It's mostly uh, Docker-based. And then you have Lava, uh, which uh, is also useful if you, for example, want to do kernel CI testing or some other part of testing. Then uh, Lava is very, has allow you to use it for multi-purposes. So um, this other option, the configuration is a bit harder, but on the other hand, like the usage is more, you can use it for multiple things. Uh, if you want to set up your own farm uh, at home or everything, you just need a few things. Uh, the server, the proxy, the charging adapters, and the ability to switch them on and off. Uh, 5 volts, 12 volts, or uh, 230 for 120 for US. Uh, switches, UART serial ports, which you access the device, and many devices. Why I'm saying many devices? Um, if, you, if you do testing and you have one device, you're lost because... Devices uh, after continuous testing uh, dying after some time and or uh, starting to be flaky. So you always want to have many devices as you can grab at the beginning because if you buy, let's say, like 15 devices today and you start testing, after one year you will have something like 12 devices. After two years you will have maybe uh, eight devices. And at the point when you cannot source these devices for you anymore, because for example, they are not sold, some development board is not sold anymore, you will get into serious problems because then you will have to introduce another type of devices, which may have different characteristics and behave a bit differently. So if we, for example, talking about performance testing, that's completely unusable to combine two types of devices. So, um, what you want is secure as many devices as you can in the beginning of the testing and don't think like, okay, it's, it will work out or later we will expand. Um, for the testing itself, um, for a building project, if you're building proprietary project which will do some testing, I think it's most reasonable to do m much diligence and as much as you can figure it out what you're going to do with it. Uh, if you work with open source community and you have multiple shell sh shareholders as a Mesa CI, for example, then you just want to start as fast as you can. Because uh, in general, the requirements change very quickly and you don't want to you don't want to like uh, define something very strictly and then you cannot expand. You want to expand and you want to change like every, every month. So for open source projects, it's better just to start and uh, formalize the requirements as you go from the experience of Mesa CI. And uh, about the configuration itself, for example, we're using mostly shell scripts and these, conf uh, and these tests and some Python scripts. Uh, what you want to do, for example, since we're testing for IMD devices, we're testing multiple architectures, we're testing multiple setups, and each setup gives you some complexity, and you want to keep it down uh, as much you can, because then you, you spend too much time on maintenance, and you do one change uh, in one place, and you forget it in second one, and it's not very efficient. So. It's always better, even if you have diverse tests, trying to keep the, the basic simple. You, you, you're always paying a huge cost for introducing something extra, and you always have to very carefully consider if it makes sense for you, if uh, you really get the benefit from it. And uh, as I said in the begin beginning, uh, developers uh, hate fixing code, so uh, always invest in pre-merge if you can if you can, at least, for, uh, at least for some part of the code, uh, which you think uh, will prevent most of failures. Another thing for open source, open source project and uh, the part we fight with really hard is uh, lower to entry barrier. Because uh, CI is not that popular as uh, everything around your project usually. You want to uh, like keep the entry points easy. 
So if someone wants to contribute, he should have chance. So at least a little bit of documentation, which is hard when like uh, CI develops really uh, quickly. And at least some person which can help out the newcomers to uh, send new merge requests with some fixes or improvements. And um, second thing is CI and uh, CI developer and developer. It's a huge difference because if you work with CI, you regenerate containers, you work with RootFS, you need like stress to CI very often. And you have kind of a little bit different requirements than uh, normal developers. So always take that in account. And what is important thing always like CI should clearly say what failed because when developer doesn't know what failed it's like completely terrible you always have to look from the point of developer why what what is going to look into log and this is pretty hard in gitlab because um, gitlab likes sections and the output itself from the console is not that perfect uh, but uh, at least highlighting uh, the failed parts, using colors, using some clean like uh, formatting is helping a lot because uh, I had over my life developers ask many times like, okay, uh, look at this log, there is like seven errors and uh, which one is failing? And I started explaining, okay, it's like seven error you can ignore, six you can ignore, five is the problem for this also to be ignored. So you want to always like report clearly as you can to the developer. And hmm, how it went? Yeah, good time. Okay, so uh, thank you. And questions? Do you have any questions about anything related, unrelated? I see question. I have mic, which is good. Now we have turn on mic. Hello, thanks. Uh, nice talk. Uh, my question was that you have 2,000 something tests, right? Um, do you have any insight into the type of overlap you have in those tests and how do you translate that into code coverage so that you know which part of the code base you are testing and which one is under tested, for example? Do you have any insight into that uh, with your CI? Generally, generally the tests are they they grow uh, they grow organically for Mesa. So as as Piglet, for example, the Piglet is great example of the natural coverage, uh, because as the developers started fixing things in different areas, they started implementing tests for them, and we sometimes fight with this because of, uh, for example, as we use fractions of uh, VK uh, CTS testing. Uh, the fractions will just pick some sets of tests and completely omit different ones. So we sometimes figure it out, we missed something. But like in general, like I think we have covered like every, in optimal case for nightly job or like the full-time job, we have like covered everything. These fractions are usually set up not by uh, selecting exactly fine-tuning it but it just like deciding okay now to the job not taking the ex expe expected 15 minutes but it taking like 25 and developers are unhappy so let's cut it and the cat will kind of change to what is going to be tested because the algorithm will just calculate different set of tests and but thanks to nightly runs we kind of don't care that much because we have most of things covered uh, did I answer it? Um, mo mostly. I was specifically wondering if you are tracking code coverage during your CI runs. No, no, we don't do that this part. At least I'm not aware. Thank you. That's a good question, thank you. Uh, the question was if uh, we have something for uh, OpenCL or CUDA-like uh, workloads. To be honest, this part is pretty uncovered yet, 
but it's changing. Uh, by recently, like we didn't have much wor working OpenCL implementation. We had Clover, which was working sometimes on something and nothing reliable. But uh, we have Rustical uh, currently implementation of uh, OpenCL 3.0. And we start talking about testing. So far, we have only some something like uh, OpenCL CTS tests. And but for applying to OpenCL workloads, we don't have anything specific yet. So sorry, not yet. But it's it's in progress. Another question. Can, can you pass the mic, please? Oh, sorry. So on the topic of being a CI developer, I think we're all familiar with, you know, trying to modify the CI workflow and then we submit it and we like wait like 15 minutes to see if our changes to the CI itself broke anything. And then you're at it all day, you know, it's like one of the more frustrating developer loops out there. So when it comes to developing the CI itself, like what's, what have you, what tricks have you found there as far as like keeping that pain to a minimum? Yeah, for, for us in the beginning, this was really painful and it still is for some part of. Um, for us, it means usually to rebuild of containers means like 60 minutes. And these days it's better because uh, originally we also built the Linux kernel because there are, there are two ways always. And as, as our CI got developed, uh, it was mostly developed by developers of the Mesa itself in the beginning. And the developers prefer to have control over things and they don't want to have multiple repositories for your CI. They want like everything in one shell script which will build everything, compile everything uh, and do everything. And they can see it by, you know, just looking into it. But as your project scales up, like Mesa, you cannot keep uh, a CI in one shell script when it's like, no, not even in 20 shell scripts. And uh, they kind of like a little bit tight and trying to get things under their control. But for like speeding up, for example, this, we did, we had like separate uh, Linux kernel repository. So what we did, we moved the CI of building kernel, for example, there, we saved like 15 minutes from the builds and the kernel is always same. So it just, just produced artifacts and DTB files. And, um, so it's about the size of the project. When it gets bigger, it's, it's better to start offloading CI things into separate uh, parts and like let it prep process for you. And another thing which I'm trying slowly get to is uh, get separate package repository and not compiling software directly into container, but uh, have it prepared. And so it, it's like a little bit of uh, fight but in the end, uh, it's like for, for the good of both sides. But of course, every time you are floating, you are losing a little bit of control. So it's, um, it has some cost. Um, so so uh, like currently we're trying to improve the containers to way of like not compiling. That helps a lot. And in the end, we should be just at the point when like in five minutes, we'll get like assembled container. And yeah, thanks for the question. So if there's no other question, thank you everyone. 